thank you and thank you all for attending. So yeah, it's a basic introduction to performance tuning. Uh, we could talk all day about performance tuning and so uh, can only really scratch the surface in, in the next 45 to 55 minutes. So. And as some of you might have seen before today, the safe harbor statement, uh, I will mainly focus on existing TA features, uh, but there might be an occasional reference to things that hasn't been released yet. And so Oracle lets you do that? Sorry? <laughs> yeah, Oracle we have to do, do it. We have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so today's agenda, uh, I will start out with some best practices and go through my two top best practices, think and monitoring. Then look at some important uh, configuration options when setting up a, uh, the initial configuration file. Look some more specific at buffers and caches, and the issue of choosing between data consistency versus performance. And finally, at the, uh, looking at the whole stack. So best practices. We all love. Best, best practices, right? It's so easy. Just do this. But my actually, my first advice is to be very often. <laughs> so there are several reasons for this. Uh, the main things are two systems are not the same. So what might work really well on one system might be really bad on another system. So you need to take these kind of things into consideration when you're applying best practices. And also, Things change. So what was really a good uh, rule of thumb back in maybe 5.0, 10 years ago, might be a really bad advice today. So uh, do think about when somebody offers you best practices. That said, some guidelines can be given. <coughs> so my first best practice is to think when you are working with your database, and uh, it's not really that different from all other things you work with. Having, uh, keep in mind what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, I'll give some more details on this uh, later. The second one, monitor your system. Really important, and it's really important for performance tuning as well. And make sure you test your chances because it might seem that some change should obviously improve, for instance, performance. Then you deploy it and it turns out it didn't. I've tried that myself, and uh, the only way uh, to minimize that risk is to test in a production-like environment. And yeah, make sure your testing actually reflects your production system. Um, doesn't help your testing on the world sample database with the biggest table having 4,000 rows and then you deploy to a system with a billion rows in, in one table and suddenly didn't be nearly the same. And make relatively small changes. Don't change too many options at the same time, particularly not if they are related, uh, because then you might have one option improved performance and other options make it worse. Overall, it looks like it had no effect and you discard it. If you change one at a time, you might realize, oh, this one is good, this one is bad, and then you overall end up with a better result. Same when you're actually changing one option. Don't jump from the minimum value to the maximum value, and because both might be horrible, in between there might be a sweet spot that you only can find by gradually uh, changing your options and then uh, monitor the effect of it. Another thing is to be mindful of your requirements. Some of the options that I'll also discuss some today will give you a choice between better throughput or uh, latency or uh, data consistency. And in some cases, Sacrificing some data consistency might be acceptable because the data can be regenerated or <coughs> new missing values might be acceptable because it's some statistical sample. In other cases, like uh, bank uh, transfers, 
it's absolutely unexcusable to lose data. So have that, that in mind as well. Sometimes you just have to accept a little slower performance to get the consistency you need. Another advice, and it's particularly true in the newer version of MySQL you use, is that the default option is often either the best choice for you, or at least a very good starting point for performance tuning. Um, and that is also something I'll get back into. Ensure all tables have a primary key. There's several reasons for this. Some storage engines, like NODB, simply almost always must have a primary key. And if you don't give it uh, and define it, NODB will add it itself as a hidden key. It will still take storage space, but you don't have any benefit from it. So it's better to add it yourself. It will also have uh, that hidden primary key in NODB also is shared basically among all NODB tables, so there can easily be some congestion there. And in replication, if you have that set up, particularly with row-based replication, where it's the actual changes that are replicating, if you don't have a primary key, you might end up doing table scans where you only needed to access one row. And when you choose your primary key uh, for NODB, it's important to be aware that NODB, NODB organizes its data according to the primary key. So it has a couple of consequences. It's necessary to include the primary key in all secondary indexes because that's how you find the actual row. So if you have a huge, let's say, UTF-8, MB4, uh, Varchar, 256 uh, column, you'll use a kilobyte of, <laughs> add a kilobyte of data to, to every row in the secondary index. You really don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, so try to choose something relatively small. Uh, and uh, it, uh, for instance, an, an integer is, is a very good choice in, in this case. And secondly, a mostly sequential primary key is optimal to avoid that inserts end up being, uh, have to go into the middle and uh, possible cause page splits and, and other issues. Uh, so in, in principle, an auto increment pri uh, a primary key is a really good choice for NODB. If you choose UUID, uh, make sure that the time components, as was discussed in the optimizer talk earlier, if you intended that, are reordered to have uh, it become sequential with time. And uh, as also mentioned, in 8.0, there are functions to help do that and convert it to a, a binary value that's much smaller to, to store as well. So what do I mean when I say it's very important to think? It sounds very obvious. And in some ways it is, but there's a little more to it. So first of all, thinking of what you're doing and why you're doing it is your best defense to catch potential issues before you make a mistake uh, on your production system. And the first thing is to analyze what your performance problem is and to make sure you understand what the issue is and what the goal is. So don't say performance is too slow, because what does that actually mean? Uh, and also, if you don't set a target, you could do this the rest of your life, because you'll never reach the end. So you need to know when it, are things good enough. So instead, formulate your problem like the query takes 10 seconds, but it's, uh, for its active use, it should finish in, uh, at most 0.1 of a second. I actually had a query like this myself, and it was possible to make such a, a huge performance uh, improvement. Or, how, uh, what is the target throughput for the system? Once you know that, then you can start analyze why you will not get your target uh, performance. And in this case, take a step back and uh, Consider things instead of just jumping to conclusions. 
and make sure you consider the whole stack. A query might be reported slow. It turns out it's actually slow at the application level. When you look at the MySQL itself, it might be fast. So the actual root cause is somewhere in between. It could be the network. It could be how uh, uh, um, MySQL sends the data. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it can be a, a all through the stack, so you need to ensure you, you evaluate the whole stack as well. And once you think you have find, found the cause, justify it. Be able to describe, preferable to somebody else, but at least for yourself, why this is actually the, the cause of your problems. And similar for uh, the solution. Start think of possible solutions, and feel free to be creative. Sometimes it's it takes weird solutions. Uh, one optimization issue I had <laughs> while working for support was a join that couldn't use indexes, um, and it was terrible slow. Um, rewriting one of those joins into a subquery, because MySQL 5, 6, and later supports adding ad hoc indexes uh, to subqueries, suddenly this query was uh, changed to actually use an index for the join and became an order of magnitude faster. So Duke have weird solutions in mind as well, sometimes they really work. It's also an example of how newer versions can give you tools to solve issues that you couldn't do in, in old uh, versions. And then similar to the course, explain why you think these solutions will work, add pros and cons, um, and, and so on. And then when you have found the solution you want to implement, write down an action plan so you know exactly what you intend to implement, test it, and then update the action plan with the results of your tests. Now you can implement the, uh, the production system. And having a test plan helps you to ensure, uh, sorry, an action plan helps you to ensure that what you implement at production is the same as you tested. There might have been a few days or even a, a longer between you uh, created the solution until you're actually applying it. So it's important to have these steps down. And it also helps you if there's some regressions that you didn't foresee to know exactly what was done so you can, might be able to reproduce it in a, a test system. The second best practice advice I had was monitoring. And that's your first, second, and third line of defense. So what do I mean by that? Well, it gives you a baseline. So when you do make changes, as it could be to configuration options, as uh, some of those will be discussed later, you can see actually what was your change. So you can might have curious per second monitored and you make a change and you can see the, uh, it goes up or down, or you might have latencies uh, uh, monitored for your queries and you can see whether the improvements are, it actually causes worse performance. It, it's also useful for investigating when some user comes and tells you, oh, the system is basically down, everything is, is too slow. You go in and log in to, uh, test and in the meantime it has been resolved. So now what happened? Again, monitoring is your friend. You can go back and look at historical data, see what happened one hour ago when the issue was occurring. And finally, it can uh, help you to altogether prevent issues. Like you might be able to see from your monitoring data that your IO subsystem is getting saturated. It's not still uh, an issue, but you can see that maybe a couple of months down the track, you will run into an issue because of database growth, uh, more users, uh, uh, et cetera. And you can use the monitoring data to take action before it becomes an actual issue. So there are several monitoring options available. And uh, for this respect, it's not so important which one you use. Uh, it's important to have a good monitoring solution and that you're familiar with it, know, understands how it works. And 
that you make sure to actually go through and configuring the alerts in the monitoring system. One issue I sometimes see is that the user was actually alerted about an important issue, but it was ignored. Make sure that you only get alerts with whatever severity level that, that is appropriate for it. If you get an SMS, text message at 2 a.m. in the morning, if you don't get out of bed to fix it, you, uh, you shouldn't have got the message in the first place. Because you have to make sure that day where the system is really down and it's really urgent that something is done, <coughs> alone the fact that you get the message, get you out of bed. <laughs> Jasper, yeah? just know the plugin for Oracle Enterprise Monitor, is that the Enterprise Manager Cloud Control? So, uh, this one? Yes. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that is a plugin for uh, Oracle Enterprise Manager. Uh, it, it is a, uh, an enterprise addition. Uh, so, <coughs> and then the Oracle wants everything to be monitored through their tools. So, we have put our little screen in the big screen. That's what it is. And in addition to those more permanent monitoring uh, solutions, it's also important to keep in mind that they are more or less real-time solutions. And I can really recommend uh, Perf on Linux. I've used it a few times myself to, to find uh, issues that seemed hopeless to, to debug otherwise. Um, MySQL Workbench has performance reports based on the sys schema. I'll get back to the sys schema in a couple of slides. And uh, some monitoring solutions of those listed here might have other sn snapshots reports such as displaying the process list or uh, other things that, that will vary from solution to solution. And uh, you can of course also run things like show process list manually to get a, a snapshot. So here's an example of the MySQL Workbench performance reports. Uh, these are available for MySQL 5, 6, and later, and they are relying on, on the SIS schema. So there's a list of reports over here, and then it, it actually cures the data to get a snapshot of what values are available right now. So here you can see, for instance, the data files are the ones that uses the most I.O. The form files that is the legacy data dictionary are a second. And then you can go in and analyze, is that actually an issue? Based on the timings here, it's reasonable to believe that the server was just started. So it's probably reasonable that it just read a lot of form files. If it's still up here after a week's uptime, you probably should look at some uh, table caches uh, to, to reduce, keep looking up the data dictionary. So what is this uh, schema? So it's a collection of views, function, and stored procedures that is aiming at making the information schema and the performance schema easier to use. So the information schema may, uh, is supposed to mainly have relatively static data, such as table, uh, columns, statistics, statistics information, whereas the performance schema is more for you know, more dynamic data, such as uh, which queries are being run, uh, I.O. information, etc. And actually, the next talk will be on dedicated to the performance schema. So if you're interested, Stay around for that. It's included by default in MySQL 5.7 and later, but it can be used with 5.6 as well, but you need to download and install it manually from GitHub. It was formerly known as PS Selber and was originally created by Mark Leeds, um, so you might have heard of it in, in that context as well. And today I can tell I'm also one of those working on it. So if you have any issues, uh, questions, feel free to come to me afterwards and, and let me know. The manual pages uh, are available in the 5.7 reference manual. Um, 
they, they should be quite good for 5.6 as well. So now I've been talking and talking about how good monitoring is. But there's actually a such a thing as too much monitoring. So all monitoring will have some overhead. And in particularly, some will have more than others. Things like show process list and show engine InnoDB status, if you run that really frequently, uh, I've seen it done run up to every second, it actually can cause outages on its own. Um, in some cases, like for the show process list, in five, six or later, there is a table called threads in the performance schema that has less overhead. So you can uh, switch to use that instead. In other cases, you will simply have to reduce the frequency a little. So do have the overhead of monitoring in mind. And finally, for monitoring, I'll give a couple of examples of how you can find slow queries that need attention. Uh, they might not necessarily be slow, but there could be other things that causes you to want to, to look into it. Um, you can use various methods. You can monitor in the, in the application. You can manually run a query and see how fast it performs. That's mainly useful during the investigation. There's the slow query log that has been around for ages and is still good because it actually persists uh, the log so you can look at it even after a server restart. And lastly, there are two examples here of using the uh, performance schema and sys schema. They're both relying on this event statement summary by digest, uh, which you have an example of here. So it contains a digest text, which is a normalized version of the query. So if you're looking up ID equals one and ID equals two, it will show up in the same uh, normalized statement. This is similar to MySQL dump slow for the slow query log, if you ever use that. And then you have the aggregated statistics, and there are many more columns that I show here. There are whether they use the ta full table scan, um, average uh, time executed, uh, minimum, uh, whether they used internal temporary tables, whether uh, indexes were used, etc. One thing you might also notice here are these timing values. They are not terrible, easy to read for a human. Um, those are the timing values you get out of the performance schema and those are in picoseconds, so 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Uh, those can be yes, uh, really hard for humans to digest. So if you look at the SUS schema output, and in this case, there are several uh, views starting with statements that has information about uh, statements sorted by various things. So here it's showing those in the 95th percentile. Here it comes out as, as nice, nice uh, human readable values. Um, and that's because the sys schema has some formatting functions, for instance, to convert bytes and timings into uh, to scale it into something that is easier to read for a human. That's what I wanted to tell about uh, monitoring. And we'll, I'll move on to looking at the initial configuration file. And doing that discussion, I will take in several options that might also need to be mod uh, uh, modified later in the life cycle of of the installation. So my recommendation, start with an empty configuration file. In the old days uh, of MySQL, there was huge templates that you could use. Uh, we got rid of those, um, and instead just use an empty configuration file. There are some things you will probably need to set, such as parts, port, and so on, particularly if you have more than one instance at the same host you will then need to, to make some modifications. I will recommend a little extra monitoring compared to the default, and you will need to look at some capacity options. And that's about it. 
I'll go more into details with this in the coming slides. So why an empty uh, configuration file as, as the outset? So in 5.6 and 5.7, a lot of work has gone in to improve the defaults. And this work continues. Uh, I'm sure there'll be other changes for 8.0. So it's no longer necessary to have various templates. Very often, the default uh, value is very good, at least as a starting point. So instead of using the template, just leave it with that and change as monitoring shows it's appropriate. So for the parts, there's a long list here of parts that should be considered. I included the error lock, uh, which is not really related to performance, but it's so important that you know where it is that it can be good to always specify it explicitly. I'll discuss some of these in, in more details uh, as well. So why would you want to set parts and not just rely on the defaults, which will place everything in the same directory. Well, the disk subsystem often becomes a bottleneck in, in database work. So you might want to split out some, fi uh, some of the files, for instance, some ta hot table spaces into separate uh, disks, or you might want to have something like the undo lock <coughs> that has a lot of random I.O. on an SSD to, uh, to improve performance. Or it might simply be that you have multiple instances that cannot, you, you cannot have those right to the same directory. And also note that it's possible for, uh, with InnoDB, for file per table, table spaces and general table spaces, when you create, it, create them to move it to a different uh, directory than the uh, original data directory. So for monitoring, what I will recommend, enable the InnoDB underscore monitor underscore enable. It said it enable everything. Uh, experience have turned out that uh, it's not really anything that has a measurable effect. And so it's, it's better to have everything available. For the performance schema, make sure it is enabled. That's the default in 5, 6, and later. And often the default configuration is a, a really good starting point. It can be configured at one time as long as it's enabled. Um, so uh, you might not need to do anything more. Though in 5.7, you might want to consider enabled <coughs> transaction monitoring if uh, you're using a lot of, of multi-statement transactions uh, in, your, in your application. So capacity settings. These are some things that are very difficult to provide a really good default value for because the range of uh, systems deployed using MySQL is, is varies so greatly. From a small test instance where uh, you only need maybe 50 megabyte InnoDB uh, buffer pool for caching data and indexes up to uh, tens of terabytes of data uh, where you just need as much memory as, as you can possibly get your hand on. So these are some things that is useful to, to consider when you're uh, deploying. So if you look for the InnoDB buffer pool into the uh, reference manual, it says on a dedicated database server, you might set the buffer pool to 80% of the machine's physical memory size. So this is one of the examples where the thinking part can be good to, to take uh, into consideration. Because what if you, for instance, have one terabyte of memory? Do you really want to reserve 200 gigabytes of memory for the operating system? Uh, probably not. So instead, you might want to go through and it's not as simple as it sounds here because it's actually hard to predict how much memory MySQL will use. But try to, to at least guesstimate how much memory you can make available. And also, 
uh, it doesn't help if the NODB buffer pool is much larger than your actually working set. In 5.7 or later, you can resize the NODP buffer pool without restarting MySQL, so it does make it much easier to, to adjust if you realize that you have used the wrong size. Related to the buffer pool is the redo lock, where uh, NODP writes out the committed transactions. The size is set by two options, so I have a number of files, and each file have a given size. And in later versions, the, the combined size can be up to just below 512 gigabytes. If you have a large review lock, you can avoid excessive checkpointing. So checkpointing <coughs> is required to avoid the redo lock to become full at some point. It's a circular lock, so there's once you have the head and tail read, you simply cannot do any more uh, write until it has been cleaned up. So you should ensure that it's large enough to avoid that. I'll give an example. And, but at the same time, have in mind that the more, basically the pages that are written to the redo log, but not still being checkpointed to the data files, are, uh, are dirty, so that needs to be done either doing shutdown or doing restart. So if it's too large, you'll have to wait too, too long to make restarts. So how to determine whether it's big enough? And I'm running a bit short on time, so I'll go very briefly through this. Uh, the slides should be made available so you can look at it in more details. Um, this number is how far you are in in commits. This number is where your last checkpoint was. And if you have all the matrix I uh, recommended to enable earlier enabled, you can get it as a plain select query, which can make things easier. The use log is simply the difference between those two. And you can then com uh, compare to the total size. And in this case, 47% of the log is used. Um, so is that good or bad? Well, it kind of depends. Because what the important thing is, is you will never want to read 75% full. Because at that point, what is called an asynchronous flush is triggered. And that will basically stall everything uh, on your system until it's done. So that will cause stores in the boat in select and write curious, and uh, it's not as innocent as it sounds with the asynchronous flush. And so you should try to keep a, a bit of headroom, uh, so you have room for, for some uh, peak that comes in uh, and then can continue flushing afterwards. Uh, that said, also be aware that newer versions have better algorithms for flushing, so it's less likely to hit this issue at all in the newer version you're using. Another example of if you're hitting this issue, the solution might be to upgrade rather than uh, trying to work around it. So here's a monitoring example of, of the examples shown before. So the bottom graph shows the usage and we can see here the 47% in this case corresponded to a peak. So it's not uh, a bad case in, in, in this situation. Had it been down here, it was 47%. It would, you, you should probably look at increasing it. And you can also see how the IO act activity goes up as the users increases. Um, so the undo lock, it's not really a capacity setting uh, as such, uh, but I will include it because it can only be changed when you first initialize InnoDB. Um, so it's quite important to, to consider uh, what you want. So in 5, 6 and later, you can choose to move the ta undo table spaces out of the system table space. 
have any of you have issues with the IB data one file being really huge and not containing any data? Because if that's the case, you probably have that it's the undo lock taking up all the space. And by moving it out, you can avoid that the IB data one file gets large. And in 5.7, there's support for online truncation of the undo table spaces. So if you had a huge uh, transaction that caused a lot of undo log or a long running transaction uh, that had to keep reviews open, then you can uh, truncate the uh, undo log table spaces afterwards and reclaim your disk space. So my recommendation is to move the undo table spaces out of the system table space. Um, and then you can also later consider moving them to a uh, SSD to uh, get better performance. Uh, but that can always be done at a later stage. Some other capacity settings. Um, be mindful of max connections. It sounds nice to increase it a lot to avoid having connection attempts rejected. But each connection does use memory and uh, file descriptors, so it might prevent uh, these resources being used for other purposes. The table caches can be re a really cheap way to get a fairly good performance gain, and it's uh, because I.O. operations are simply so expensive, particularly the definition cache, you should definitely ensure that you can have all your table definitions uh, open at, at all times. The table open cache can be split into instances. This uh, helps on contention. It makes it cheaper to find tables to edit if it's too small. In 5.7, the default value has been set to 16, and that's a really good starting point also in 5.6. So, uh, our general recommend, uh, recommendation in support when somebody asks for, for this setting, we just say put it to 16. Buffers and caches, surely caching is a good thing. And surely for something that is good, the bigger the better, right? Um, no. Um, and here's a few examples why you should be careful. It's true that buffers and caches can be very good, but uh, pick them carefully. First example, the query cache. This was enabled by default earlier. It has been disabled for some versions now. And for a good reason, it's actually often a performance bottleneck. So the query cache works by taking the raw query submitted and storing the result set with it. But it's all guarded by a single mutex. So if you have 100 concurrent queries, they'll have to line up waiting to check the query cache one by one. So that's terrible for concurrent workloads. In practice, usually disabling the query cache and look at potentially other caching solutions is, is a, a better a way to move forward. <coughs> Another buffer is the join buffer. This is also an example of an option that has changed a bit of meaning over the years. In MySQL 5.5 and earlier, it had a relatively limited usage. And there was no reason to have it larger than what could, uh, one row could fit into it. So if you didn't have any rows larger than 32 kilobytes, uh, having it at one megabyte would just be waste. However, in 5.6 and later, an optimization called batch key access was introduced that also uses the join buffer. And in some cases, for some queries, it can actually be beneficial to have a relatively large join buffer to be able to fully take advantage of this optimization. I will not go into so this optimization. It's uh, a bit beyond introduction level. So. And then thing to be aware of, join buffer size 
is the minimum size allocated. So if your join just needs 100 bytes of buffer, but you've set join buffer size to one gigabyte, one gigabyte of memory is allocated. And memory allocations are expensive, so it will really hurt the performance. So instead, keep a small global, the default value for new connections, for instance, between 32 kilobytes and 256 kilobytes is usually a good range. And then increase if your session, your query is actually needed. And a similar story for the sort buffer size. Same range is usually a, a good value. Um, our performance architect always use the 32 kilobytes. That's what his uh, test show is the best value for his, for his workload. It is, of course, workload dependent as well. This one can be relatively easy monitored through search merge passes, which is a status variable. You can get it like this. If this one increments with a few, like five to 10 per seconds, it's usually you're in the right ballpark. Um, and again, it can be increased at a per connection or per session basis. So if you know you have a query that needs to do a huge sort, you can increase it and, and get the benefit of the last buffer. So why do I keep advocating small sizes beyond trying to reduce the overall memory usage? Well, in some cases, as for the uh, giant buffer, it's a minimum size, so you don't really want to allocate more than you actually need. But also, for instance, with the glibc malloc uh, library on Linux, which is the default used, crossing certain uh, thresholds can cause it to be an order of magnitude or more slower to allocate the memory. So even if you're in principle could benefit from the larger buffer, and sometimes that overhead of allocating it makes it better to choose a smaller buffer and, and live with the overhead of having a, a, in principle too small a buffer. <coughs> Eventually, testing is the only one that can really show what, what is the best for your workload. So, data consistency versus performance. So, uh, two examples, InnoDB Floss Log at Transaction Commit and Sync Bin Log uh, later. So, in order of s data safety, you can have three different values depending on how often uh, you sync. The safest and the default is one, where every uh, commit will cause a sync of the the redo log. That's required for the D for durability in ACID, and, and it's also why it's recommended. But you would think that that's the slowest as well, and it is. However, if you make certain changes such as using separate disks, consider an SSD, particularly if you have a high commit rate, because the redo log is sequ uh, sequential write and read, so Spinning disk is in principle good, but you might run out of how many flushes you can do per second. Whereas SSD can handle more flushes, so that can be a useful reason for choosing an SSD. And also battery back disk cache can help you. Sync bin lock is a bit similar, but it's for the binary lock that is used for replication and for point in time recovery. Three classes of settings, zero, MySQL will only flush the uh, log to disk when uh, it's, uh, the log is rotated. One happens in every commit, so this is the safest, and a positive integer will flush every n commits. The default value used to be zero, now it's one, and one of the reasons we've been able to change the default value is that InnoDB now supports group commits 
which uh, reduces the overhead of of having the value set to one. Again, an example of how upgrading can give you some benefits in terms of performance. So, a warning: if you don't set the value to one, if you're having a replication set up and the master crashes, you'll most likely have to rebuild the slave, or it will be out of sync. But you could argue sync bin log equals zero surely must be the the uh, best performing. Again, as with the caches and buffers, it's not always quite that simple. So by default, and um, the maximum allowed value is that the bin lock is rotated when they're one gigabyte large. Back when this feature was implemented, one gigabyte of memory was a lot. So they, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> not. So often if you have this, the operating system will end up caching the whole binary lock. And then when you're rotating it, suddenly you have one gigabyte that has to be written to this. And while that is done, no commits can happen. So if you see in your show process list, the several cures waiting in commit, and it happens to be while the log is rotating, consider looking at sync bin lock. So in short, sync bin lock equals zero will probably give you the best throughput, but setting it equals to one might actually give more predictable performance, and often that's as important as as the throughput itself. So final topic is to consider the whole stack. So when you have a performance problem, that can occur anywhere, uh, application through to MySQL, anywhere in between. So you need to take that into consideration both when investigating and when monitoring. Make sure your monitoring solution monitors disk usage, network, memory, etc. And you should also, with respect to configuration, consider the operating system and hardware settings. A couple of examples. The I.O. scheduler. Uh, on Linux, you have uh, several choices. On many distributions, the CFQ scheduler is the default. That works pretty well for reads. It's terrible for writes because it serializes. So really poor for a typical database uh, workload. So change the scheduler to either to no up or deadline. It's really easy to check what your current scheduler is. It's in the square brackets. And you can change dynamically to write into the same file. And then you can confirm that it has been changed. And you can also set it at boot time to ensure that you have the, the same value each time the, the host is restarted. Second example, the memory allocation library. Remember, zone clip C is the, the default. It's actually often a bottleneck on Linux. It's better to choose TC malloc or JE malloc. They're both under active development, so I prefer that it's being tested at, uh, for your workload, what is at currently the, the most optimal. Um, how you change the uh, the malloc library use depend on exactly how you start MySQL. If you use MySQL D safe, you can add something like this to your MySQL configuration file, where you set the malloc lib option to the path to the to the uh, malloc library. Oh. Um, if you use system D, you set the LD underscore preload option in etc sysconfig high scale. So reaching the end of the talk and wrapping it all up, in short, performance tuning in, in MySQL is actually not that different from other types of performance tuning or, or uh, problem solving in general. 
Um, many of these things, you'll, if you're a developer, software developer, you'll probably have heard of them while optimizing your software as well. Um, make sure that you understand what your requirements are. Consider the whole stack and consider whether upgrading is actually the easiest way to, to get where you need to, to be. Thank you very much, and I think there might be one or two minutes left for questions. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned the transaction monitoring. How do you monitor the transaction actually? It means, for example, there are some certain of inserts or bids are doing on the, for example, order table, and some goes to the customer table. So how you can monitor it? Means, is there any flagging you can mention on the transaction? So you're thinking of that uh, for the performance schema enabling transaction monitoring? Is, is that the means you mentioned for uh, trans uh, transaction monitoring? So I wonder is this available by default or is it part of the performance schema? So it's in the performance schema. So uh, there's a hierarchy of uh, transaction statements. Statements might have sub statements like a store procedure invoking a, a different. A statement statements have stages, and stages have various uh, weights, and it's that highest level of transaction you can enable. So, so when you go in and look at events in the performance schema, you can get that this transaction included these five queries, for instance. Okay, so this is the thing which we can enable in the performance schema. Yes. So would you recommend something for the load testing, for example, if I enable a general log on the main production DB. So what I have is a single file and everything is written in a sequential order in that particular file. If I replay that file on some testing instance, it is a sequential manner, if it will in a sequential order. What I actually want is uh, it will run as a parallel as compared to the database load, load which comes from uh, a load of queries come from different users. So is there anything which we can test the same thing or simulate this load of the, of the production to some testing instance? Yeah, I believe there is some script somewhere that can uh, take a general log and choose the timestamps to to replay with the right intervals. And can I know I'm searching for this? <laughs> no. uh, if I recall correctly, I don't I wonder whether it's part of the Pacona toolkit. I'm not completely sure. But you might want to try to look there as a first place. No, there is no, we cannot talk about that now. Oh. No, that's kind of cool thing. So you are prepared now. Okay, there is no tool kit for that. You need to write some self script. Self script. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you.